Welcome to Melt. I'm Suresh Venkat. We continue our conversation with corporate thought leader and marketing maven D. Shiv Shivkumar. While last week's chat was about strategy, ESG, ONDC, and more, you can watch all of that, by the way, at readytomelt.com if you haven't already. Today, Shiv explores management, leadership, corporate culture, and more. So, without further ado, let's get ready to melt with Shiv Shivkumar. Shiv, the years 2020 and 2021 and part of 2022 were called the years of the Great Resignation. And after some time, people called it the year of the Great Reconsideration. What is 23 going to be for both employers and employees? So, 2023 is going to be the year of the employer. Okay. okay. It will not be the year of the employee. Fundamentally, the... So, no more uh, BMW cars and bikes as sign-on gifts and all that, nothing? All that's over? So, all the flexible policies and all the wooing and dating of employees, I think, is already evaporating. Because there is a fundamental clash between what the employee wants and what the employer wants. The employee wants flexibility in terms of saying, I will work from where I want, I'll work when I want. The employer is saying, I'd like to see you in office. The trouble also, Suresh, is that there is no conclusive data to show that working from home or working from anywhere is more productive. In fact, the data actually shows the opposite. The employee is saying, I don't believe the data. But data is data at the end of the day. So the way I see it is, employers will say, hey, you know what? This task involves teamwork. So you better be here. In high power distance countries, most managers and leaders want to see their people around. Mm -hmm. India is a high power distance country. What does that mean? High power distance? It's like uh, a... Which means, sir, yes, sir, no, sir. Oh, the three power distance school, between sir. the two people is very high. In the hierarchy. The hierarchy. All right. So people want to see office. Next is, look at it from the employee point of view. He says, if I'm not in office, will I be disfavored? When it comes to promotions, when it comes Correct. to increments. Correct. Because my boss hasn't seen my face. Okay my face or whatever it is, will, will I be challenged? So will the boss have an inner circle and an outer circle? Outer circle is people who don't come regularly to office. Inner circle is people who come regularly to office. So till you remove these kind of doubts, it will not change. However, if you are an individual contributor, you can work from anywhere. Okay. I believe the more evolved companies will take the stance that employees are mature. We will treat them in a mature manner and let them decide. But to the employee, my advice would be multi-skill yourself. If you are a single skilled employee, you are in trouble in a future world. You need to multi-skill yourself, go to the edtech platforms, take a lot of courses, see what the future is and skill yourself in that direction. If you don't do that, you might become redundant because the industry is changing and the skill set is changing. And there's all the buzz about chat GPT these days, about yes, AI replacing copywriting, AI replacing coding. Absolutely. So I don't know how to compete with that. I don't know what skills I can acquire to compete with that. Right? The other thing that you've been very bullish on in your writings is the metaverse. Many marketers are first asking, A, where is this metaverse? And B, what is this metaverse all about? Metaverse, I've had the advantage of uh, visiting uh, both Accenture and uh, Microsoft and learning from them over the last 18 months or so. I learned a lot from them and I must thank them. I also learned a lot from people like Gesture Research who are Microsoft ecosystem partners. Uh, Metaverse is simply everything in three-dimensional. Imagine something is in three-dimensional. Okay? That's what Metaverse is, full stop. You have your avatar, everything you see in 3D. I'll give you the applications of Metaverse, simple application of Metaverse, which I saw. A doctor in Bangalore is operating on the heart of a patient. Sitting on his left shoulder via Metaverse is a doctor from Mysore telling him, hey, think about this, think about that, do this, do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so everything which was distance challenged will now be distance bridged with Metaverse. Why am I bullish about it? Today, there are more than 70 countries in the world which have 5G. Okay, so speeds are not a problem. And that's one. Second is, the key thing is the headset. It's still a bit clunky with all the headset Absolutely and the wires right. and the paraphernalia and all The that. headset is today 40, 50,000 rupees. The day it drops to 10,000 rupees, it will take off. But for it to drop to 10,000 rupees, the whole electronics ecosystem, the China manufacturing thing, the chips, the sensors, everything has to come into place. 
but I believe it will happen. It's a matter of time, it will happen and there will be many use cases. The ultimate use case, finally, what happens when a technology takes off? When it permeates things like shopping. That's what UPI did, right? Mm -hmm. Now you can pay for vegetables, you can pay for anything uh, via the UPI app. So when you actually do shopping, I have been to these places, Microsoft and Accenture, where by wearing the goggles, I can take a product, look at it in three dimension. I can look at the sole of a shoe, I can look at the heel of a shoe, every single thing. I don't need to go to the shop. Then I decide what I want to do with it. Okay, so everything is three dimensional. It will make shopping so much more pleasurable and exciting. Education will be that. Imagine tomorrow there is a Rihanna concert. You can sign up for it in Metaverse. You can be there and enjoy the thing and you're part of it. So anything which was distance challenged in the past, that experience will come to you in your home. The people who disagree with you to play devil's advocate would say, but human beings want human connection. I want to go to a shop. I want to talk to a salesperson. I want to interact with fans in a Rihanna concert. So will this conflict with the metaverse vision? Just go back to the question we just asked five minutes ago. Everybody said, you know, if I work from home, okay, will I lose all my friends, this, that, etc. That didn't happen. Okay, people will choose. At the end of the day, they want the choice. They find a way. Correct. And when you go to metaverse, it's not single. I can go with my gang. There are four of us who go. There are four of us who can still drink. There are four of us who can still party and four of us who can still enjoy the experience. It's not single. It's still community it's also. It's not as anonymized and as isolating Absolutely. as it is visualized to be. Shiv, the word VUCA used to stand for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. And it still stands for that. But I'm told you have a different definition of this term, <laughs> VUCA. What is your definition you know, and why does it matter to marketers? I always say that, you know, VUCA is a nice descriptive model. It describes to you what is volatile, uncertain, ambiguous, you know, complex, etc. But it didn't tell you what to do with it. Mm -hmm. Okay. What is the origin of VUCA? It was when the Iron Curtain fell and all that happened. And it was the armed forces in America who actually coined this expression. To describe the world that you're living. A lot of marketing terms come from battle in the armed forces. Absolutely. Uh, right from the original days. For correct. example, a lot of leadership came from that. Correct. Target. Okay. And Absolutely. Rommel was called the desert fox. Yeah. Okay. So, target, bombing, this, that. Oh, lots yes. of things. Okay. Come from that. The way I look at it is, take VUCA as it is. Whether it's an individual or a company, the VUCA I give you is V for versatility. You have to be versatile. A good example I'll give you of versatility is IPL. If you're not a three-skill player, you don't get mm -hmm. value. Mm -hmm. Sam Curran, Ben Stokes, Dhoni. Why? Somebody like Stokes, batsman, bowler, captain, great fielder. Okay. If you're a single-skill player like Pujara, like Smith, like Rahane, like Labasham, okay, like Joe Root, you'll be challenged. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have to be versatile. At the very least, you need to be a great fielder. Absolutely, at the very least. correct. Yeah. You have to have multi-skills, two, three, four, even better. Ultimate butler. You know? Great batsman, great wicketkeeper, great captain. Okay, people will pay you for that, top dollar for it. Okay, so versatile. For a company, versatility means embracing different business models and not saying this is what worked for me in the past, I will stay. Mm -hmm. You for me stands for uncomfortable. None of us know how Tomorrow will play out. Yeah. But you should have the courage to say, I'm willing to go there. I don't know everything. As Mandela put it, courage is not the ability not to have fear, but the ability to overcome it. All of us have fear. We don't know how the future will play. Okay. C is for collaboration. And I go back to the ecosystem point. Today, you have to collaborate with many more people to make things work. In the old days, all you needed was the retailer. If you're selling an F, fast moving consumer good. You told him what to do, you ran, etc. And everything went through. Today, that's not true. You have many different forces coming together for you to you know, execute a sale. And A, some people say agility, etc. I say accountability. You know, one of the challenges uh, which has happened, uh, Suresh, a lot of business people and marketeers have become very articulate. The danger of becoming very articulate is that there's no accountability. Because you are able to explain everything in a nice manner. And you believe your own. Uh, you believe your own uh, Kool-Aid, yeah. as we say. So I think accountability is very important. If you don't hold yourself accountable in the interests of the institution and the company you represent, 
then you're doing yourself a disfavor. People who hold themselves accountable, organizations who hold themselves accountable to a higher ideal, they are the people who will win. So to me, it's versatile, uncomfortable collaboration, accountability. That's what I believe will win. Now let's talk about the Indian manager, right? You talked about some of the attributes people are going to need in 2023 and beyond. Various studies have shown that Indian managers may or may not match up to their global peers. You've worked with both Indians and with non-Indians. What's your frank assessment? Do our managers by and large match up to their global peers? I would say Indians, if you look at it, a lot of the Indian managers who go global are well-educated. Mm -hmm. And they come from uh, good institutes, good background. You know, they've done well for the local company here. They go abroad or they work for an Indian company and, you know, they go abroad, whatever it is. I think by and large, Indian managers are very good on the quantitative side. Mm -hmm. By and large, they're very facile with numbers. Okay, so that's a plus point. That's a plus point. There are a lot of Indian managers by and large who are pretty good in English. Mm -hmm. English comes to them naturally. Okay, which is a very good thing, very positive because anywhere in the world you're sitting, you're able to hold yourself and communicate in the language of business which is, you know, English uh, globally. That's the other thing. The other one I would say is, by and large, Indian managers are pretty sharp. Okay? The things where Indian managers could be better at, in my book, I think Indian managers can contribute a lot more without expecting something in return. Mm -hmm. You know, we tend to say, okay, why should I do this? What's in it for transactional. me? Transactional. Yeah, I think we tend to be a little more transactional and less this thing. We don't tend to give our time liberally. Okay, we hold you know, ourselves back. I think that's something that you know, we should uh, think about. The other thing Indian managers could be better at is that I think we should learn how to speak truth to power. We are not that good at it. Again, it goes back to the power distance uh, yes, culture. Yes, also three bags of culture that, absolutely, that we absolutely, need to break. Because in a fast changing world, and I think you, know, you really need to you know, think about that. And the last one I would say is Indian managers should not externalize. You know, while you celebrate Indianness, I think you also need to show some humility. Okay, you can't say all the success is due to my incredible thinking. Absolutely. And all the failures are due to bad market timing. Okay, so Shiv, next question. If you were tasked with starting a B school today to teach Indian managers these values, where would you start and how would you start teaching them? If I were to take a concept which I believe more and more people should understand is ecosystem. Okay. The days of independent growth are over. It's dependent growth. You lean on each other. Okay. okay. So you have to think much more ecosystem, much more collaboration, much more give and take. It's not about, I'm the stronger brand. So, you know, you better give this to me. No. I think together we can make things happen. I think that is something which... Could be one of the core offerings in a education. In a business school. Course. Because I think by definition, why do people go to business school? They go to business school because they want to improve their financial status. By and large, yeah. 58% of the reason why people go to a business school is for better prospects on salary. What happens because of that endeavor is they tend to compete with each other for the jobs on campus. Okay. They do not see it as a whole batch and a whole system which can benefit the country, the industry or whatever. So we start that dog-eat-dog -dog world or that shark-eat-shark -shark world right. right at the time of placements. Absolutely. So if you can actually make them learn a lot more about ecosystem, etc., I think that will be worthwhile. Because that ecosystem will have subparts like business models, will have subparts like negotiation, will have subparts like give and take, things like that. So to me, the ecosystem... And some people argue that Indian management schools could do it with a lot more philosophy and ethics, especially with ethics governing, let's say, genetic manipulation and artificial intelligence. Would you say that has some credence, the fact that we See, need more ethics and philosophy education? Yeah, there are some things which, you know, uh, we don't know much about and we'll, know, we'll not know much about. We'll continue. For example, uh, let me take mobile phones as a journey. In 2005-06, when we started this journey uh, you know, of mobile phones in Nokia, Airtel, etc., there were just 90 million consumers with phones. Yeah. Today, there are a billion people. Yeah, who knew this would turn out this But way. we said that it will happen in a decade and it happened. But none of us saw, or some of us saw it, none of us saw that privacy will become extremely important. Mm -hmm. Now, privacy is both a positive and a negative for consumers. Yeah. So, for example, if you tell consumers, hey, you know what? I think you're overeating. 
I think you need to watch it. It is consumer won't mind that. Yeah. But the consumer will not want you praying all the time. The consumer is worried how you use his or her information. Yeah. And the, the transactional nature of that is what's worrying. So if you look at trust in technology, it has dropped from 77 to 72 last year in 10 years time. Yeah. The reason is privacy. Data breaches and the Cambridge Analytica of absolutely the world have right. not helped. So people want to be absolutely sure that I will give you my data as long as you use it responsibly and you use it to help me. That's the important part. If your sole objective of having my data is to push more and more of your partners and your other people brands on me, it's terrible. For example, I have an app which is about how many steps I walk a day. Yeah. Okay, I do that. Every time I open that app, there are 10,000 ads Shoot on it. Ads and that ads and this ads. And I'm trying to tell yeah. them, guys, wake up, Correct. what are you doing? This is abuse of customer Absolutely privilege. Absolutely right. right. Everywhere I shop, people say, give me a cell phone number. I say, sorry, I don't want spamming. Seven different pop-ups when Absolutely. you open an app before you book a so movie ticket. So marketers and all must get far more responsible about these kind of things. For example, you had advertising in television shows and movies, right? Why do today movies advertise? No advertising movie, one break movie. Why do they do that? Because consumers are tired. Okay, the mobile phone ecosystem also must recognize that consumers are vexed, not tired right now. I, I truly hope marketers learn that one lesson from this interview if they learn nothing else. You've met all kinds of CEOs, Shiv. Uh, you've also written about leadership in various forums. I've also met multiple kinds of CEOs, moody, compassionate, ruthless, introverted, flamboyant, not flamboyant, all sorts of CEOs. Can you give me three traits that unites all great CEOs? My experience with CEOs is that by and large, they're humble. By and large, they're relevant for the future. So they're constantly educating themselves about what matters in the future. Okay, the examples they talk about in meetings, etc. are always forward looking. They're not resting on what they did 10 years ago. Okay, they're using that maybe as an analogy to say, hey, this is how uh, to leap, etc. I think that's uh, important. I think they always work for the good of the institution, mm -hmm. whichever institution they represent. They do not work for their good or their success. Their success comes from the success of the institution. Okay, okay. I think that's very important. And one thing which I would say, which I've seen in these days is that their ability to hold people accountable. You know, a lot of CEOs, you know, believe in fluff, you know. Yeah. Uh, Suresh, I know you had a bad year, that's okay, you are a great guy, etc. I think the ability to call a spade a spade on the issue and not the person. Mm -hmm. I'm calling it because I'm invested in you, Suresh. That's why I'm calling it out. If I was not invested in you, I would get into puffery and fluff. And I think good CEOs know when to call it as it is and to say, hey, you are accountable. Okay, that's important. But how do you get there yeah. is more important. That is the question. I believe the, the best CEOs I've seen are extremely disciplined. Okay, time management, reading, coming prepared for a meeting, whatever you brief them, they're thorough. So D is for discipline. E is they have oodles of energy. They come into meetings with energy, they go in uh, to customer uh, reviews with energy, etc. Because they have taken good care of their physical and mental balance. Mm -hmm. If you are not physically fit, you will really never be yeah. mentally alert. So the best CEOs have a combination of judging that. And the third one, a very important quality to do that right, is focus. There are 1000 things which everybody wants your attention on. On a daily basis for you to pick three or five things where you know that your time is most important and you can add the most value. If you get involved in everything, yeah. you're lacking focus. So discipline, energy and focus is absolutely crucial if you want to be a successful CEO. All right, almost at the end of the interview, Shiv. Two more questions. This time, uh, questions of a personal nature. Yeah. You went to IIT and IIM. That's the classic CEO combination. I didn't go to either of those two colleges. What is it that you people at IIT and IIM, what is this magic and why can't all of us also learn it? I think the democratization of talent has happened a lot more in the last 10-15 years. I think the days of IIT, IIM, I think are the days past in my book, honestly. Mm -hmm. okay? There's so much good talent out there from so many… And not necessarily with this pedigree. Absolutely right. Okay. 
in the old days that was true because the very best went to each of these uh, places yeah. or whatever it was so that was only natural i believe what that kind of formal education any formal education does for you is gives you structured thinking that's a very important thing number one number two you are rubbing shoulders with some of the best people best students okay that itself is a high and a kick okay so you are in class with suresh you vibe in a particular way he brings something to the table you bring something to the table and a lot of these guys tend to be or at least tended to be all rounders as opposed to bookworms or unidimensional people going back to the multi skilling i talked about they were good in sport they were good in culture they were good orators they were good debaters they were good quizzers you know plus also studies okay so they were much more all round and finally the quality of experience and the teachers in the institute made a huge difference because what can a teacher do he can spark your creativity and thinking he can make you think differently and i think that's what great institutions do okay they take a great product and make it even better and the way i would say it is you know they take carbon carbon and diamond are the same except the well, lining put under pressure absolutely yeah. that's what it is so they take carbon and they shine it chisel it and make it and a put it under a lot of pressure otherwise put it a lot of pressure yeah. make it a fine diamond and then the diamonds off okay shiv you've had an enviable career but who have you envied is there anybody's career who you envy that's a very good question actually and i think uh, the first time anybody is asking me that question okay why do people become jealous okay at one level people are insecure when somebody is insecure then he is jealous of somebody's achievement or success or whatever it is second is somebody feels that hey you know what i am entitled to it mm-hmm. that's the other thing and third is people are paranoid oh, i need to i need to be a vp by the time i'm 35 i right. need to be x by whatever it is etc right. okay these are reasons why people get obsessed and get into this race the best example i would give you of zero jealousy and great you know respect is federer versus nadal mm-hmm. think about that when federer was playing his last match when he made the speech nadal was crying cry i know now that's a very touching scene mm-hmm. and i believe in the last 10 years sure sadly i think we've seen lesser respect amongst peer group in ceos lesser respect even amongst marketing teams for their agency and agency for the client some of we've lost the ability to be balanced and nice to each other all i would say is you must do your best in whatever is given to you for example if nokia had not turned out the way it was maybe it would have been somewhere else with nokia correct okay 1050 but, but nokia who knows? who knows who knows but it happened all the talented people in nokia they had to find new ways okay and a lot of people swam and uh, went to new shores mm-hmm. okay so the thing i would say is there is only so much you can do to be good at whatever you are and you must do that to the best i've always said whatever is handed over to me i must do the very very best okay i must do it properly so i have lived by principles which are if i take over a job from suresh i will not diss on that a lot of people spend one year saying suresh did a bad job this is exactly doing the previous predecessor yeah. it's a waste that is one form of insecurity i see this all the time with managers in every company it's the most wasteful thing because your employees and your team are completely like rabbits in a headlight look ahead completely stay relevant invest in yourself and say i want to be the best at whatever i choose okay luck can favor you if you're very good and you're relevant opportunities will come knocking on your door on the other hand if you're not prepared you're not relevant no opportunities will luck will bypass then you. you'll become jealous all right okay shiv thank you very much this has been an exciting interview and a long interview thank you very much for being part of it my pleasure suresh it was absolutely a delight after many years we're doing this together thank you pleasure and with that is finally a wrap on our conversation with shiv shiv kumar Remember you can watch part 1 and all our archives at readytomelt.com. You can also follow Melt on social media the handle is ready to melt. If you'd like to follow me I'm @sovenk on Twitter. Goodbye and thanks for watching. <laughs>